This morning we'll be looking at a topic. I very rarely do a topical message or a topical sermon. In fact, it was incredibly uh, a lot more of a challenge for me to do, this, to do a topic. And of course, I, I picked a topic that was rather broad, probably too broad. Um, picked the topic of faith. That's a big topic in Christianity. Um, one of the most defining topics. So um, we're going to primarily be looking at Hebrews 11 and portions of Genesis where we will look at the father of our faith. And the purpose of this is the last several messages in um, Mark have been dealing with a lot of uh, healings and other things in continuously through the book you run into this subject of faith and in particular there was this woman uh, who had had a, an issue of blood for 12 years and we were discussing her healing and I used a phrase um, and I, I, I called her faith I think uh, It was, it was substandard faith, I think I used a term, or some other things like that. And I guess that was probably not the best characterization of her faith. But when we look at something like faith, we have to understand that we're looking at it from many different directions, potentially. And so from the outside view, it might look one way. From another view, it might look another, a different way. And so, the only way for us to really understand what's going on here is we need to examine faith, biblical faith, carefully and closely. And of course, another, another idea is this, this, a lot of Christian doctrines are not well known outside of the church uh, popularly. For example, propitiation. That one's one of those words that's hardly known outside the church. But the word faith is very well known outside the church, and it has a lot of connotations there that we should be aware of. Because we want to know what faith is according to the Bible. Now, uh, one of the beauties of, of this particular one, some of the doctrines that we have, we have to uh, give a definition of them based on a variety of passages and kind of a theologian evaluating them and so on. Faith, actually, we have a definition, a very simple and plain definition. In Hebrews 1, or Hebrews 11, verses 1 and following. So I'd like you to turn there. What we'll do is we're going to examine the elements of faith, what faith is scripturally, both in Hebrews and a variety of other places. And then we're going to jump into Genesis and examine the life of the father of faith and see where these things are. And when we've done all that, I think we'll still have time, and we'll examine very briefly the woman and how her faith coincides with biblical faith. Okay? Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 3. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Jump ahead to verse 6 for me. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we have these verses. They, they plainly lay out faith in a, in a definable manner. Um, I looked at some other translations. That first verse, uh, it, it seems almost enigmatic. Faith is a substance. Well, what's that, right? Well, some of the other translations will say faith is the assurance or possibly faith is the realization, the reality. It's the substance of things hoped for. But it's also something else. It's the evidence of things not seen. And um, some of the other translations also used for the word evidence, they use the word proof or conviction. 
I really like that word conviction in this case. Convictions uh, of things that aren't seen. We're, something we, we, we know is there, but we've never seen it. Okay. But that leads us to all kinds of interesting questions about what faith might be. But let's begin with some basic things. Faith itself, and we're going to deal with saving faith. I want to make that clear too, because there's saving faith, which is that faith which makes conversion, which brings a, a sinner to Christ. And then there's the faith that a Christian gets as he grows in his faith. He gains faith as he walks with his Lord. We're not going to talk so much about that. We're going to talk about saving faith, converting faith. Faith is a gift of God. Very, very familiar passage, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Okay, so we hear that. How is it that faith is the gift of God and not salvation? Someone will say, well, how do you know? It says it is the gift of God. Where, what does it point to? It's true. Sometimes uh, a word like it can point to an antecedent several verses back. That's not what's happening here. If you go back and say that the salvation is the gift itself and not the faith, then you make nonsense of the passage. Actually, faith itself is also a gift of God. We do not have faith of ourselves. It, it follows along the path that, that we understand that we're dead in our sins and trespasses. Dead people cannot believe in something they haven't seen. They, they can't think. They can't comprehend. They can do nothing. So faith itself is a gift. But more important than that, faith is a disposition. And when I say that, that you know, what does that word disposition mean? Well, you break the word down. Position, right? Faith is a position toward or against something. And that's what faith is with God. Faith is a disposition toward God, okay? When you're not a believer, when you haven't come to faith, your disposition is away from God. When you've converted, you've turned towards God, you now have a disposition toward God, okay? There's many verses that we can use here, but realize that the, the default position for all of us before we were saved is that we were not disposed towards God. We hated him. We were turned the other way, running off after our own ways. Uh, Hebrews 3.12 tells us that, Beware, brethren, lest it, there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So it's a disposition towards God, not away from God. All men by nature are not towards God. There is none righteous, no, not one. So then, to have true faith is to believe that which God has asserted. And here's where the rubber meets the road. Belief. Faith and belief, they're almost the same exact word. In the Greek, many times, it's exactly that same word, pistis. Genesis 15, 6, Romans 4, 3 through 6, um, Galatians 3, 6 through 9, and Hebrews 11, 8, all talk about Abraham. So let's look at the Romans 4, 3 through 6 briefly. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. 
But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man whom God imputes righteousness. Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. We're going to examine that. But Paul also tells us in Galatians, speaking of that exact same point, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So it's very, very important that we examine this, this faithful man, the father of our faith. When uh, you read through the Gospels, oftentimes you see Jesus interacting with the, the Pharisees and, and they claim that Abraham is their father. And Jesus said, if Abraham were your father, you would believe me and the works that I do. Abraham is the father, according to this scripture, of the faithful, of those of faith, Jews and Gentiles. Hebrews 8, 11, 8, if you look down your passage there, you can go to verse 8 there. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. So there's an aspect of obedience there, isn't there? So let's look. Let's look at these elements of faith specifically. The first thing, the, the, the essence of faith is assurance or trust. And we can see that in verse 13 of Hebrews 11. These speaking of a number already, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They died in faith without having received the promises. What is a promise if it's not received? But here, they had such confidence in the promise, they knew they would get it anyway. Even the Death was not going to get in the way of this promise. Because there's something about this faith that holds them to it. There's an assurance, a strong conviction, trust. Another element of faith is commitment or committal okay so we having having uh, received this conviction that God is 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 truthful to us that he's called us we call upon him he's opened our eyes to our to our condition hasn't he so we go to Romans 10 and we see this is a very familiar passage if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is over all, is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So there's a calling upon God that is associated to saving faith. Now, there's also three aspects of your personhood that's involved in this faith. Your mind, your heart, and your will. And we often uh, hear little theological debates in, in a church such as ours about the mind. Well, you know, 
intellect, intellectual assent, right? We, we need to believe something. We need to think about it and we need to believe it, right? And, and of course, the theological debate comes when, you know, is that all there is? Is that all I have to do is believe in my mind? And that's one of those great debates out there. We know that the answer to that is no, there's, there's not. It's far more than just believing in your mind because you have to take action. It, it goes to um, James and what, what he has said. Faith without works is dead faith. You say you believe, prove it. But the verse that I put for your mind is this. It's one of these um, negative side of the, of the equation verses. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You see, faith does involve the mind. It does involve the mind. But it never stops there. It also involves the heart. True faith should move you emotionally. And we don't believe in emotionalism, perhaps, but true faith sets love of this God before you. First Peter 2, 7 tells us, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. He's precious. But is he precious? To you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And Peter continues in his discussion. But he's precious. That's an element of faith. You want to see true conversion in a person? Look to see, do they love the Lord? Do, do, their, do their, their words and their actions exude a love for God? If all they're about is theological debate, can I win the argument? And they only study the Bible to be able to understand things like that, but you don't see them praying? They don't have any affection toward the Lord? Maybe that's you sometimes. It shouldn't be. You should cultivate love for your God because that's real faith. Finally, faith acts. And I tied that into the issue with the mind because what comes into the mind, now we must respond. Okay? Faith acts. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. James 2.26. So that's, there's our definition of faith. Let's describe faith now by looking at Abraham. If you'll turn to Genesis 12, we're going to look at the first five verses there. We're going to move fairly rapidly now because I wanted to lay the groundwork carefully. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 5. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your fa family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, I will, and I will curse you who curses you. And in, all, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Let me ask you a question now about Abram. Does Abraham know the Lord yet? Has there been the conversion that we've been talking about? Is there faith? Has there been any interaction scripturally before this point between him and God? Look back to chapter 11. What will you see? 
you'll see the end of a, a series of genealogies culminating in Abraham and his, and his brothers. But you see no interaction that we know of of Abraham with God that's, that's listed here. Yet God, it says just abruptly, the Lord said to him, get out of your country, go to a place that I will show you. And he just gets up and does it. No questions asked. And no apparent relationship to go off of. If I walked over to my brother over here and asked him, I said, look, I have a great need. Can you borrow me some money? He might likely give it to me because he knows me. He'd be concerned about it, but he knows me. But some guy walking down the street who asks him for $500, I'm sorry, man, here, here's 50 bucks for, for you know, uh, lunch or something, right? You, you, you might do that. Because there's relationship that's built that, that, where he has this idea of trust. He's not just going to do anything. But Abraham does. And he does a big thing. If I asked you to get up and move across the country to a place you've not been to where you do not have relatives, will you do it? Yet Abraham just does. Now, the answer is, no, Abraham doesn't know the Lord yet. But he acts as though he does. He responds to this Lord. Now, why does he do that? He knows something of the Lord, doesn't he? If we go back to uh, those verses, actually, I don't think we've looked at them yet. Um, I referenced the, the, the um, depravity of man, but we didn't look at some of these verses here. Take a look at Romans 1, verse 19. I apologize that you have to keep turning, but this is the only way to do a subject-based sermon. Romans chapter 1. Look at verses 19 and 20. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay? And if we go back to our definition time, Hebrews 11, verse 3, we see the exact same kind of thing there. We see a reference to creation. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. We know that God exists, and so did Abraham. He may not have known him personally, but when this God reached down and touched him and said, Go, he said, I'm on it. He's gone. He obeys, and his obedience is out of pure faith. But it's not a blind faith, because he, but we all know that God exists. You see how, how our faith is an informed incent, or, assent in knowledge? We know God exists. We know we're responsible to him, and we have to act when he makes that call upon us. So what does Abraham do when he gets to Canaan? What's the first thing he does? He builds an altar to the Lord at the Oaks of Mare. Chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, you can see it. Abraham builds an altar. Now, what do you do at an altar? Among other things, you, you sir, certainly you sacrifice, and then you make, you make a supplication unto the Lord. Right? That's what altars are for. He builds an altar. Well, we mentioned that the person of faith calls upon the Lord. Well, here's that call, the beginning of it. We see it many times. You'll see that um, two verses later, he moves again. He's just a, 
a nomad in a tent, and he keeps moving. Now he moves from the Oaks of Moray to a place where Bethel is on the west and Ai is on the east. That's their definition in the scriptures. And he builds another altar. And it says explicitly now that he begins to call on the name of the Lord. Specifically, at this point, we know he's calling. The rest of that chapter continues where now there's a famine and Abraham has to go to Egypt and we have all this happening. Chapter 13 begins and Abraham is leaving Egypt now and he returns back to the place, to the altar that he built between Bethel and Ai and he begins to call upon the name of the Lord once again. Genesis 13, 4, there it is. He calls on the name of the Lord. And then in verses 14, 14 to 18, God speaks to him and now t begins to give him some inkling of why he's there. He says, look, look all around you, east, west, north, south, everything you can see will be yours and your seed after you. Now that must have been a surprise because he had no children. He's already 75 years old and he has no children at all. And we say, ah, oh, we all know this story. We know it, David. Who do you know that's 75 years old today? Think about them, their physical capacities, their health, their ability. And to be told that you're going to have a son didn't matter. Abraham is beginning to grow in his understanding of who this God is. So he sets up camp in Hebron and builds another altar to the Lord. There he is calling on the Lord again. You see, faith is driving him to call on God. But the, 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 the most significant passage is in chapter 15. So if you'll turn there, the, verse, the first six verses tell us if, if we're not sure whether he knows the Lord, at this point we see he knows the Lord. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And he brought him outside, and he said, Look to the, toward the heaven, and count the stars if you be able to number them. And he said, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And the word believed here really had the idea of a strong conviction, a certainty. It, it had the, word, the, the feeling of assurance behind it. It's not a Greek word that I'm familiar with. It's a Hebrew word. But it's the same exact meaning, folks. He believed God. We see this and we, we, it kind of goes over us a little. Look toward the heaven and count the stars. Well. We've been counting the stars for a long time now in our modern days. You know, they have a database of stars. There are so many stars that they've just, they, they stop naming them. They, they number them in this database. And if you want, you can get your name attached to this little database as you, this is, for example, Jed's star or this is Donnie's star. You, whatever name you want, you can buy it now. That's how many, there are billions of stars. But God says, so shall your descendants be. And he has no child at all, not even one. 
and he's already 75. It's a pretty big, tall order. But he believes in the Lord. He's been calling on the Lord. He's been seeing the Lord has been faithful in little things. He's become aware this God's able. This is, this is how faith is worked out in a life. This is how faith can be worked out in your lives. Do we believe that God can do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we think or pray for? Or are we a people of small things? Probably that's where we are most of the time, isn't it? There's a whole lot of other material I'd like to look at, but I don't, don't think we need to. 25 years goes by. And finally, in Genesis 21, Isaac is born, the child of the promise. In the middle, we've got this whole situation with another son that's born and uh, maybe a point where, you know, Abraham has a little lack of faith. Well, I guess that means he's not much different than we are in some ways, isn't he? Yet he's the father of the faithful. He's the father of our faith. Maybe you've stumbled in your ways. Maybe you've made grave decisions, and now you've got to walk in those things. Well, the Lord has his way even beyond what you've done wrong. Be faithful. Be faithful. struggling whether I should even include this portion in my sermon, um, but I think I will pass it over. I'll just briefly reference it. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful picture when we see Abraham take his son, his only son, and bring him to Mount Moriah to sacrifice. And there's a lot of good material there. But if I want to be faithful to you in saving faith and describing and de defining saving faith, this wouldn't be in that area. This would be now we're past saving faith. We've found all the elements of faith already in Abraham's life. So this would just be extra blessings. Maybe we could look at it briefly. Um, but we need to get to the woman as well. Because it's, it's the whole account with her and that encounter of her that I want to clarify for you. So let's just turn to Mark chapter 5, verses 25 to 34, and we'll finish off through this section. Mark chapter 5, verses 25 to 34. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. It's a pretty astounding story. But this woman, we don't know anything about her. Some people actually, some, some of the theologians will call her the anonymous woman. Um, it's quite possible she was not even Jewish. She certainly understood 
Uh, 12 years with such an affliction. I want you to go back 12 years. How old were you? What was life like for you? That's a lot of time under the, a lot of water under the dam, folks. 12 years that she suffered with this affliction and it got worse as the days got by. And no matter how many doctors she saw, how many witch doctors she might have saw, how many crazy things she tried, nothing worked. But everything got worse. But she hears about Jesus and she says, finally. Does this woman have trust or assurance? Well, Mark 5, 28 tells us this plainly. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And of course, this, 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 in the English it says made well. It's the Greek word sozo, which is also used to be translated as saved or delivered. She may have been thinking delivered of her malady. But God had a bigger deliverance for her. Yeah, she had trust. She knew it. She said, if only I may touch his clothes. I just have to get close to him. Does she have a commitment? Well, remember the idea of a committal or a commitment had to do with calling on the name of the Lord. What does she do? Well, look at verse 33. We see in verse 33, the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before her and told him the whole truth. Now, we might say that isn't exactly what I was thinking, Dave. But she bows down in worship. She's afraid for the crowd. And she's a woman who's been unclean and probably knew she didn't belong in this crowd. But she touches him and she thinks, maybe if I, if I can just touch him, and she doesn't really know how this is going to happen. Suddenly she's healed and now she's got to deal with this. And, and instead of ducking and running, like maybe you or I might have done, she, she stays. And she, in fact, she, she returns to, to where, you know, if the crowd had been moving along, she moves forward and bows down to him and confesses everything. Does she have the elements of faith? Well, verse 27 tells us that she had heard about him. Now, think about this. There's an intellectual aspect, right? She heard about him, so she knew he was in the area. Jesus has had now a year and a half, at least, of a public ministry. He'd been all around. Every place he went, there were crowds. People were coming from as far as 90 miles away with sick ones. We've seen that all through the book of Mark, as I've been preaching through Mark. So this woman had heard about Jesus, and she finally says, I've got to go see him. Now... We say that's pretty ordinary. She just thinks that, right? Put yourself in her position. She'd spent everything. She'd done all these cockamamie tricks and all the doctor's things. She should have been jaded. She should have, should have had a disposition against God. But no. She loves God. She turns and runs to him. Do you let your afflictions drive you from God and make you bitter? Or do you let them drive you to God, knowing that he's your exceeding great reward and your shield? Heart and will, yeah. She has the elements of faith. Even though she's afraid because of the crowd, she comes. She acts. She gets in the thick of it. I'm not one that likes to get into crowds. And I imagine she probably didn't like to be around people as well with her affliction. This is not going to be an easy affliction to hide. 
just just put yourself there and say, boy, this is this is no small thing. She went into a crowd. This could have been a potentially embarrassing thing. She didn't consider that because she had faith. And maybe the term that that I used a few weeks ago, superstitious faith, maybe that was ill-advised. I, I, I didn't come up with it on my own. I saw it from more than, actually three different theologians of other sorts, you know, commentaries, used that exact phrase. I was, and so when I used it, I used it with that advisement. But this woman had faith. She had true faith. She had saving faith. And this, this whole idea of faith ought to be instructive for us. There's, I, I just think that uh, we need to be have, have a recognition that, our, that faith is, is far more than just uh, believing in our head, but it is action, it is trust. It's strong assurance. It's having a disposition towards God and not against him. And every day we battle faith, don't we? Because we do have a disposition against God by nature. And only because of the Lord's reaching down and giving us that first gift of faith, that's, that's our only um, expectation if he hasn't done that, we're, we're like those outside. Well, that's what I have for this morning. So let's go ahead and uh, I guess we have a song here. I think it's in the song book. It is Hymn of Hope.